In this video, I'm going to talk about Neisseria meningitidis. This is one of the main organisms in the Neisseria group. The other one we haven't really talked about much yet, and that's Neisseria gonorrhea. Um, they do have some things in common, obviously some things different. Um, one of the main ones with this one is the predilection of this one for CNS tissue, but that isn't all it causes. Um, it does cause a significant um, septicemia that can be can certainly be fatal and can be very dangerous. This is a highly dangerous pathogen. Thankfully, there is a vaccine for it, um, which has really changed how um, we look at this particular infection. Okay, so let's start with kind of some main characteristics. Um, first off, this is a small gram-negative diplococci, as you can kind of see here. So there's all these small little organisms, and then there's some of these bigger cells that you're seeing. These bigger cells are actually neutrophils that are coming into the area to um, respond to the gram-negatives. So we're actually looking at these guys right here. These guys are actually your um, gram-negative diplococci. You can actually kind of see they're near these cells. Um, so humans are the only natural host. This, we're the whole show. We're the only place that this organism can hang out, um, which I guess is kind of good. We can't catch it from anyone else, but that certainly doesn't stop us from passing it around. Um, it is transmitted person to person through aerosols or respiratory tract. Um, so one of the things that we kind of worry about is like water fountains, um, people sharing things like inhalers, like I don't know about anyone else, but like, so I was a competitive figure skater. Um, and sometimes I'd go up to do my routine or whatever and I'd forget my inhaler. And I had another friend um, who also had asthma and sometime we had the same prescription and you're definitely not supposed to do this. Do not do this, it is very dangerous. But we were dumb kids and sometimes I would just go like, oh, here, use mine or, you, or I'd use hers. Um, and that's a really great way to contract something like Neisseria meningitidis. Um, water bottles, uh, people share those on sports teams. So any of those things where people are passing things around, not a great idea. Um, all right, so anyway, uh, it's a highly fastidious, fastidious organism, um, which ha means it really has kind of specific growth requirements. Um, so if you're growing out a culture, you basically have to grow it out twice. You have to grow it out on like a normal um, auger, like blood or um, chocolate. Chocolate is actually really good for growing it out. Um, but you also need to grow it out on a selective culture, like Thayer Martin. Um, so Thayer Martin might actually grow it out a lot better. The problem is that oftentimes selective media contain antibiotics that sometimes Neisseria might be susceptible to, in which case you might not see it. So you're better off growing it out in both places and seeing what happens. It has kind of this interesting ability to metabolize sugar, so glucose and maltose, um, and that differs from Neisseria gonorrhea, which is able to um, grow out uh, maltose, I believe, but not glucose. So you kind of see this change in how the organisms are able to ferment these sugars, and that can be somewhat helpful in identifying it. It's oxidase and catalase positive, um, and structurally it has kind of some interesting things. It has this polysaccharide capsule around it along with these pili, and together these are really good at helping the organism avoid phagocytosis, right? Because a polysaccharide um, pili really just makes the outside of this organism slippery so that it rolls away when kind of these chopsticks on my macrophage reach out to grab it, kind of like trying to grab an egg yolk with chopsticks. It also has lipooligosaccharides, saccharides, which we've talked about with um, C. jejuni and some other organisms, so it has kind of these interesting things on its surface. It often also contains endotoxin um, or endotoxic activity, um, and that certainly um, can lead to some of the clinical manifestations that we see. Um, don't forget that actually there is um, one specific uh, deficiency, and basically it's when you have um, deficiencies in the MAC complex. So I actually have C9 listed here, and technically, yes, C9 would be part of it, but the real thing is when you have deficiencies in C7 and C8, right? Because C9, technically, there is no like known phenotype. But when you have deficiencies in that MAC complex, that's when we tend to see a higher um, susceptibility to nice serial infections.
Okay, let's talk clinical disease. Um, this one can be pretty devastating. Um, so it's named meningitis, uh, partially because it causes meningitis. Um, this is normally a disease that begins really abrupt. And think about it. Um, when I was talking in the bacterial meningitis video, I said that this was kind of the most common cause for patients who were a year to 29 years of age. This is pretty much the healthiest time in our lives. Um, it was not that long ago that I um, unfortunately ticked past this 29 mark to um, 30 and now unfortunately beyond that. But um, I can tell you that uh, as you get older, you do not often feel as good as say you did at 16. Um, so these are really healthy people. I mean, that's what this is about. You've got these healthy, vital kids um, who are coming down with um, these conditions. So you get this abrupt onset of headache um, and meningeal signs. So what does that mean? Fever, um, nuchal rigidity, um, maybe sensitivity to light. Um, and you can, in young children, you can have these really nonspecific signs like fever and vomiting. Um, and if untreated, uh, mortality approaches 100%, um, but it is less than 10% in patients who are adequately treated. Um, so treatment, once again, if we're gonna do that empiric therapy with ceftriaxone, that's normally pretty effective. Um, and in that case, the incidence of neurologic sequelae is even pretty low. So you'll see some hearing deficits, maybe a little learning disability, and arthritis is pretty common. The other kind of main um, clinical disease we think of is meningococcemia. This is basically a septicemia, and it can occur with or without meningitis. Um, this is certainly a life-threatening disease. You get thrombosis of the small blood vessels um, and multi-organ environment involvement, and that's kind of the characteristic clinical features. And then you also get um, these petechial lesions, which I'm showing here on the on the trunk and the lower extremities. So when um, my predecessor used to teach this, he would say, you know, you'd see a patient and they'd kind of come in with meningitis symptoms, maybe maybe a little bit of a headache, maybe just, you know, a fever. And you're looking at them and you're going, ah, I'm not really certain what it was. And sometimes before you'd get the culture back, you'd begin to see this rash. And then you'd go, oh man, I think I know what I'm dealing with and it's Neisseria. Um, so eventually what can happen if you get into this um, position, you've got these small petechial skin lesions that then start to coalesce and they form this kind of hemorrhagic um, lesion. And if you get overwhelming DIC with shock, you're gonna get this bilateral destruction of the adrenal gland. And that's gonna lead to waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome, which unfortunately is what um, this poor child experienced. Um, and that is often failure and you get bleeding into the adrenal glands and shut down and multi-organ shut down. Um, there is also a milder chronic septicemia that has been observed, um, which I'm not really talking about here, but yeah, you can see that as well. Um, and in that case, the bacteremia can persist for days or weeks. And the only signs of infection are really just this low grade fever, maybe a little bit of arthritis and a petechial rash. Okay, so to diagnose it, you can do a gram stain of the CSF if we're thinking it's meningitis, right? Um, that's gonna be sensitive and specific, so it's gonna be really helpful. However, when you do a gram stain on the blood, it doesn't seem to be as effective. Um, there's normally too few organisms present unless the patient already has like an overwhelming sepsis, in which case you might see the organisms. But remember, we'd want to catch it way before that. Um, culture is definitive, but remember, it's kind of difficult. This is kind of a picky eater for an organism. It's got, you know, these special growth requirements. Um, and it dies rapidly if it's exposed to anything too cold or dry or anything. So um, culture can be difficult. Um, but that is still a really, um, that's kind of your gold standard. You can technically de de detect meningococcal antigens, but they're kind of insensitive and nonspecific, so it's not incredibly trusted. So how do we treat it? How do we prevent it? Well, first off, breastfeeding tends to give patients a bit of a passive immunity. Why? Because there's a vaccine. So mom has the vaccine, so she has the antibodies, and she passes them on to baby. I love when a plan comes together. Um, in the meantime, remember your empiric treatment, because if you follow your empiric treatment protocols for now anyway, ceftriaxone is pretty good at um, taking care of this one. Thanks for listening.